Uh, hi, everyone. Welcome to the QSOF seminar. Uh, today, we have Alex May from Stanford University. And uh, Alex, the floor is yours. OK, great. Well, uh, <clears throat> thank you very much for the invitation to speak today. Um, what I'm going to be speaking about is some connections between some ideas in high energy physics, in particular in quantum gravity. And a subject that has come out of uh, quantum cryptography, which is non-local quantum computation. And it's really a pleasure to be talking about this here to this group specifically, um, because many of the ideas and, and really nice papers about non-local computation um, that have influenced my thinking about this a lot are coming from um, various members of this group. So it's great to be bringing this back to you and, and showing you what these ideas have done in an unexpected area. <clears throat> um, okay, so in terms of papers, I, I first discussed this connection in this paper back in 2019. Some of the more technical things I'll say today are coming from uh, this paper, which was done in collaboration with uh, a graduate student here, Sam Cree. And then um, there's also a paper with uh, a few more of the results that should be appearing reasonably soon. Okay. <clears throat> um, so in, in very broad strokes, the outline of what I want to talk about today is I'm first going to discuss some background in, in quantum gravity. And what I'll need to explain there is what's called the ADS-CFT correspondence. I, I'm not gonna assume that you know anything about this. I'll try and explain exactly what you need to know. Um, it's just gonna be at a pretty high conceptual level or sort of picture level, uh, so it shouldn't be too bad. But please ask me any questions. It's very easy for me to say, you know, something that can't possibly make sense to you just because the language is, uh, is, is very different. Um, good, so then the second thing I'll talk about is this connection to non-local quantum computation, um, the connection between, between that and, and ADS-CFT. And then finally, in the later part of the talk, I wanna talk about some implications of this connection, and in particular, uh, what kind of questions this connection raises about non-local quantum computation, and a little bit about the work that I've been doing to try and understand um, those questions. Okay. All right, so I'll start with this ADS-CFT correspondence. And Part of the, the setting there, and so the first thing I want to talk about is what's called anti-de Sitter space. Okay, so anti-de Sitter space is a particular kind of space time, which means it's a, it's a manifold um, equipped with a, a metric, a Lorentzian metric. That metric is a solution to Einstein's equations of general relativity. Okay, so this is some kind of valid solution in, in classical gravity. Um, <clears throat> The picture I'm going to draw to represent this anti de Sitter space will be this cylinder. I'm going to draw the cylinder a lot, so it's worth going through what's going on here. In the cylinder picture, the time direction of my space, of my space time, goes upwards. Okay. And then the planar directions are spatial directions. And in the picture I've drawn, there's two of them. So there's a radial direction like this, and then some kind of an angular direction. Because there's two spatial directions, this is what's called ADS2 plus one, right? Two space and one time directions. Um, everything I'm going to say will apply in higher dimensions as well, where I would have more angular directions. So in general, this circle is replaced by a, a sphere. Um, the picture is easiest to draw in two plus one, so I'm going to stick to that picture. Okay. To understand this geometry a little bit better, uh, it's helpful to look at a restricted portion of it. So I'm going to set the time to be a constant. So say the time is just zero. Then the geometry that I'm left over with is the geometry of the hyperbolic disk. Okay, so you might be familiar with hyperbolic disk. It comes up in, in mathematics in various places. Um, if not, I've illustrated it with this beautiful picture due to Escher. So the way that this picture works is physical distances in this geometry are represented with these lizards. So that means that if you're standing in this space time and you're measuring the distances between points with your ruler, the distance you're going to measure is counted off in terms of the number of lizards that you sweep out. OK. Um, <clears throat> what you can see is that the lizards are big in the middle and small on towards the edge of the disk, right? And that's because in terms of coordinate distance, right? so distance on the, on the page, um, like a unit coordinate distance here is a lot of distance, and a unit coordinate distance here is much less distance. 
Okay, this is just the way that the metric on this on this disk works. Okay. One thing that this means is that um, the distance between any point in the interior of the disk and the boundary of the disk is actually infinite, right? So this is an infinitely extended space time, but I've chosen coordinates such that it looks like a compact region, or I can draw it in a compact region. Okay. Um, okay, so that's a little bit about the geometry of ADS. It's a slightly strange place, but this is where we're going to work. And now uh, I can tell you about this ADS CFT correspondence. Okay, so what ADS CFT is, is an assertion that two apparently very different looking physical theories are equivalent in some sense. Okay. The two theories are a theory of quantum gravity in one of these ADS space times. Okay, so that's this cylinder. And then on the other side of the equivalence, a, a special kind of field theory called the conformal field theory that lives on the boundary of that ADS space. So I've taken my ADS space, I've unrolled the boundary, I've cut it open, and I get this rectangle where the sides here are identified. OK. So what do I mean when I say that these theories are equivalent? What it means is any quantity you might want to talk about on, say, the quantum gravity side, you can determine via some calculation on the other side. So for example, if I arrange some experiment in the quantum gravity theory, and I want to you know, work out what the outcome of that experiment is going to be, there's, in principle, some calculation I can do in the conformal field theory to determine that, that outcome. OK. The converse is also true. So if, um, if I say I wanted to measure some correlation function in my conformal field theory, there's in principle some calculation I can do in the quantum gravity theory to determine that correlation function. OK. <clears throat> um, just for some nomenclature, just some wording, I'm going to refer to the, the gravity side of this equivalence just as the bulk. and then the conformal field theory side of this equivalence just as the boundary. OK. So we, we don't even understand you know, any sort of microscopic details about exactly how this works. I'm just going to give you a couple of bullet points about you know, things you need to know about this ADS-CFT correspondence. So the first bullet point is that on the gravity side of this duality in the bulk, we have gravitational physics. So we can have, for instance, I don't know, like a, a star with a planet orbiting around it. That isn't, that's one solution that could be described in the, the quantum gravity side. Um, <clears throat> we could also say have like a, a gravity wave propagating through my space time or something like that. So all, all of the interest in gravitational physics is included in the, in the quantum, quantum gravity side of the duality. Okay. In contrast, in the conformal field theory, we just have a fixed geometry. And so there's apparently no gravitational physics. There's just quantum mechanical degrees of freedom. OK. Um, the second thing to know is that on the gravity side, in addition to the gravitational degrees of freedom, there's also quantum mechanical degrees of freedom. So we, it would make sense, for instance, to think about, say, a spin 1 half system sitting inside my bulk somewhere. Um, it would also make sense to you know, think about some unitary evolution process happening to that um, spin one half system. Okay, so I can sort of think about uh, quantum information processing happening in the bulk space time, and that will have some description in the conformal field theory. Okay. Last comment, which is just an obvious one, but worth emphasizing, is that uh, the bulk side of this duality is one higher dimensional than the boundary side. So here we have some radial direction, right? And we have physics in d plus one dimensions. And then in the conformal field theory, we have no radial direction. We just have d dimensions. Despite this, the conformal field theory describes everything that, that happens in the bulk. OK. <clears throat> OK, so that's what you need to know, know about ADS-CFT. Before I move on, I just want to make some comments sort of about the significance of this, of this correspondence and, and why people are interested in it. So the first thing is that 
ADS CFT is a consistent theory of quantum gravity that's valid at all energy scales, right? So this coming up with such a theory is really the holy grail of research in high energy physics. And so it's extremely exciting that we have such a such an object, right? And the discovery of ADS CFT is one of the great discoveries in, in high energy physics of the last 50 years or something. Okay. So <clears throat> this is of course very exciting, but there are some caveats, right? And the caveats are maybe there's two main ones. So the first is that ultimately we want a theory of quantum gravity that describes you know, gravity in our universe that, that we live in. Um, we don't, however, live in an asymptotically ADS space, or we don't live in ADS space. Um, so yeah, that's, that's one important fact. It is a theory of quantum gravity, but it's not quite the right one. Another point in a similar direction. Alex, is, yeah. so, so why don't we live in ADS space? Time. Yeah, so you. Uh, not that I want to, but. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so, so ADS space is a solution to Einstein's equations where this number, the cosmological constant, is constant and negative. Mm -hmm. And that number in our universe seems to be positive. Um, so if you're familiar with these recent, well, not recent, but these measurements that show that the expansion of the universe is accelerating mm -hmm. this is an indication that that number ha has the wrong sign okay to the ADS. yeah um yeah so so the cosmologists maybe the short answer is like the cosmologists tell me that we don't live in ads space good yeah, yeah. okay good uh, yeah please please interrupt for questions anytime that's that's great um <clears throat> Okay, yeah, so we don't live in ADS space. Another reason that ADS CFT is not a description of quantum gravity in our universe is just that if you look at sort of the, the detailed realizations of this ADS CFT correspondence, like detailed at the level of you explicitly write down what the Lagrangian is in the bulk and in the boundary, what you'll see is, is those theories have, um, have certain symmetries that we don't have in our universe. So in particular, they feature supersymmetry, um, which is just a, you know, a symmetry in particle physics that, that we don't see in, in the standard model. Okay. And so far, we don't have any, you know, realizations of ADS CFT with, that are lacking this, this supersymmetry. But, okay, so this is another issue. Um, still, despite these caveats, we think there's a lot to learn from ADS CFT. And, and we're still very excited about it. And that's just because, you know, it is a theory of quantum gravity. Um, we might want to study it and understand what lessons we can extract from it that we can then use to understand, you know, quantum gravity in, in our universe, right? Um, <clears throat> right, because it's still, it's still very impressive, for instance, that it describes, you know, Einstein's equations as emerging from some quantum mechanical degrees of freedom. And we would like to understand how that how that can happen. So the sort of questions that people might ask about EDS CFT would be, for instance, you know, how can it be that this lower dimensional quantum mechanical theory of just the conformal field theory um, can encode some higher dimensional physics, right? How do you get this extra dimension? Um, that's a feature that we think gravity in our universe will will still have. We we think that there'll be this lower dimensional description. And, and so this is something we're very interested in. Um, and then, yeah, like I was saying, how can it be that, you know, somehow this, this metric sort of degree of freedom described by Einstein's equations can be recorded into, into quantum mechanics? You know, what kind of, a, of objects do I look at in the quantum mechanical theory to, to understand that physics? Okay. Um, okay, so that's everything I was gonna say about ADS CFT. That's the most unfamiliar thing I'll talk about. So maybe I should pause and, and take any questions um, if there are any. If I may, mm -hmm. similar to the question asked by Hari, yeah. this supersymmetry which isn't observed, is that the matter of the particles not having been found? Or is it that the measurements are actually incompatible with? the supersymmetry predictions yeah i think <clears throat> i think the kind of 
okay, well, maybe I should preface this by saying this is the supersymmetry and, and more formal string theory is getting a little bit outside of my range of expertise. But my understanding is that the sort of supersymmetry that you ha would have in these examples of ADS CFT um, would have, for instance, like all kinds of particle, all the particles we have would come with a, a, a partner particle with a similar mass. So there'd be an electron and then there'd be a, a super, like a super electron partner and it would have a similar mass. And so we should have seen it if there were such a particle. Um, so yeah, the, the kind of supersymmetry that you would expect is just ruled out by, by obvious experiments. Um, supersymmetry more generally, like some people still think, some particle physicists still think that there could be supersymmetry in our universe, but it's like a broken symmetry and you have to go to higher, high, very high energies to see, um, to see, to see that it's, it's there, but that's sort of another topic. Okay. So it's something we have not observed, but nothing to the contrary. Yeah. But so, yeah. So the, the kind of Lagrangians you would have in ADS CFT, it's just clear we don't have in our, in our universe. There's still like, gauge theories and quantum field theories, they, they have the right ingredients that we see in our universe, but, um, but, but still very different. Okay, thanks. Yeah, thank you. Can I still ask a question? Yeah. Like, I mean, the obvious question here, it's probably very naive, but what about mappings between the sitter space and, and, and CFT? Like, like people surely must have tried that like, yes. like strenuously and what came out of yes. that? Um, okay, yeah. Pe People have tried that. People are still trying that. Um, there are issues with doing that that I don't fully understand or appreciate. Um, yeah, the most naive sort of things you can do kind of somehow don't make sense, or I'm told makes don't make sense. Like you, you can wick rotate from de sitter into to anti de sitter and, and vice versa. Um, but somehow everything goes haywire here. And I guess like, Formally, you can try and do this, but like when you do that mapping at the CFT level, the theory that you get just doesn't make sense anymore. It's you know non-unitary, for instance. Or and is there some sort of formal impossibility proof that any kind of reasonable mapping between uh, DS and CFT would violate one of the things you would like it to satisfy? I I don't think so. I think this is an open open direction. I, another thing that people try and do, which is more popular right now, and I, I think maybe a bit more promising is they try and embed embed de sitter in a higher dimensional ADS, or embed a cosmological space time in a higher dimensional ADS, and then you can have this conformal field theory description of your de sitter space. Mm -hmm. um, so there's some work like that ongoing. Thanks. Yeah. Did so I the just problem. Oh, sorry. On a similar line to Ronald. Yeah. Um, yeah, so on large scales, obviously our universe is not ADS and the yeah. two are completely different cases. But if you look um, on a small enough scale, then the, the overall curvature doesn't really matter. Mm -hmm. uh, so is it possible to use ADS CFT as a local description of quantum yeah. gravity in our universe, so like on a small patch of space time? Yeah. Yeah, so that, that's a great point. That's one reason that we think, you know, there's still a lot to learn from ADS CFT and that you can probe anything that you think is just sort of local physics, you can probe using ADS CFT by, by yeah, looking at a small patch. Um, some people, you know, there's definitely a line of work that tries to exploit this to understand, I don't know, say, say like a scattering process, you know, you have some particles coming in and scattering and you want to understand what are the scattering amplitudes when you have gravity present and when you have you know, really a theory of quantum gravity? You can try and probe that question within ADS CFT. And you would think that the answer you get because of what you're saying is still valid even in, say, flat space or in sitter space or something like that. Um, yeah. But, but yeah, there is this issue of that part, part of the key difference between ADS and, for instance, De sitter or something more reasonable cosmologically is that ADS has a good time direction at the boundary. 
So you go infinitely far away and there's still this like notion of time going up. Whereas in, um, you know, in flat space, for instance, the equivalent diagram looks like a diamond and, and there's sort of, when you go infinitely far away, there's kind of only one point. There's no like, there's no time direction here. And so it's hard to define a theory without having like a notion of time. Yeah, okay, cool, thanks. Yeah. Well, there, there is a time like direction, right? But it cannot be reached in finite. I mean, the infinite space like infinity cannot be reached in finite time. Is that not the, 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 the difference here? Um, With let's say the sitter space and flat space on the one hand and ADS on the other hand. Well, there's I thought so anyway. Yeah. So there's an there, in flat space there's null infinity, right? Like there's these these null surfaces. Mm -hmm. um, but I I don't I think like uh, I don't think there's a there's any notion of of a time direction like at spatial infinity. Right? Um, Yeah, like the Penrose diagram of ADS is usually written with these, drawn with these straight timelike boundaries, uh, right? Yeah. Where yeah. things can reach. Yeah, that's yeah. what I mean. Yeah. yeah, that's right. Like these are these are the timelike boundaries. Um, yeah. Any other questions about this? Um, okay, so so good. So that that's ADS CFT, and now I'll try and explain what the connection is to the subject of non-local quantum computation. And um, some of you are more expert in me than me in this subject, but some may not be familiar. So let me just briefly recap what I mean by a non-local computation. Um, so I'm going to think about computations that happen in a space-time context. Okay, so we have um some points in space right so this is a, a space-time diagram and at this point say i'm going to introduce some quantum system which i'm going to call a zero and over here i'm going to introduce some quantum system call it a one some process is going to happen in space-time right and then the outputs from this computation call them b0 and b1 should appear at some later space-time points okay so there's some overall transformation, say some unitary U that relates the inputs and the outputs. There's two different ways or two different you know, processes in space-time via which this can happen. And the first way is what I'll call the local way. And in this case, we just do the obvious thing of bringing A0 and A1 together, interacting them directly and, and doing the unitary. Right? And then bring the outputs out again. <clears throat> The alternative way of doing this is what I've shown on the right here. So here we distribute some entangled state between the left and the right, which I've called psi v0 v1, right? So we have this entangled state. And then we interact a0 and one end, end of that entangled state, v0. And then we interact v1 and a1. So the yellow dots are all like, say, quantum channels happening. Then we exchange a round of communication. Right. And then we interact locally on the left and the right again. And at the end of this process, we're supposed to have reproduced the same overall transformation as happened at the left. So the inputs and outputs on the right should also be related by this unitary U. Okay. This um, was first thought about in the context of um, cryptography and in, in particular, this idea of position verification. So there you're trying to um, check if somebody is doing operations within a given space-time region. So say this box like this, right? And the point is that on the left, you do do the operation within the space-time region. And on the right, you get away with, with not doing it. Okay. And so this means that these local computations correspond to honest strategies in this cryptographic setting. And the non-local computation corresponds to a dishonest or cheating strategy in the non-local computation. Okay. <clears throat> okay, so that's local and non-local computation or what I'm gonna mean by those words. Now, let me bring this back into this, the context of ADS-CFT. Okay, so I'm gonna think about one of these 
computations that happen in a space-time context, but I'm going to choose to have them happen in my anti-dissider space, right? Um, <clears throat> so I've chosen these four points, C0, C1, R0, and R1. I'm going to consider introducing these uh, quantum systems, A0 and A1. I've chosen these points to be from the perspective of, of the ADS space off at spatial infinity. Okay, so I've pushed them all the way out to the edge of the cylinder. Okay. Um, A0 and A1 are going to come in from infinity, uh, meet in the middle somewhere, have this unitary happen, and then come out again. And then the output systems will come out again. Right. So I've chosen these points in such a way that the way that this computation happens in the ADS picture, in the bulk picture, will be via this local computation. Okay. Um, one linguistic addition here is I'm going to call the place where this unitary can happen in the bulk, I'm going to call it the scattering region. Okay. Um, we don't need to know too much about the scattering region, just that it's some finite region within the bulk. Okay, so if I say try to bring A0 and A1 together um, too late, like I brought them up here, uh, then they couldn't get out to R0 and R1, right? So this is not a part of the scattering region, but but this is. Okay, so there's some finite like blob in the bit in 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 the inside that that is this this region of the scattering region. Okay. How can you get these two systems together if they start out at infinity? Right. Okay. <laughs> Got that. So um, ADS space has a very strange feature, which is that um, light rays reach the boundary or come in from the boundary in finite time. So if you are like a time like observer, you have a mass then it takes infinitely long for you to reach um, for you to reach the boundary. But if you're a light ray, you get there in finite time. So what we're doing here is recording our quantum systems into some photons, say, and then I can think about them coming in from the boundary after some finite amount of time. It's a, it's a peculiarity of the metric there. But. Okay. Okay, good. So so this is the, the bulk picture. The bulk does, picture. Does yeah. that mean that the speed of light is infinite then? Um in this in this theory. The speed of light is, is well, you know, we always call the speed of light one. Um, but it's just that. Yeah, I'm not sure how to describe this. I mean. You, I mean, okay, you could think of it as, no, actually, okay, I'm not sure how to give an intuition for it. Basically, okay, you write down some metric, right, um, that describes the space time. You solve for the, the null geodesics. You find that they reach the boundary in some finite time. And then, you know, <laughs> you, you throw up your hands and you say, this isn't, uh, this isn't how my world works, but this is how this, this metric works. Good. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay. Yeah. So, so. Okay. So yeah, computation in the bulk happens via this this local process. Now I want to think about the same process happening, but in the boundary perspective. Okay. So I chose those four points, C0, C1, R0, and R1, to be off at spatial infinity. And I've done that so that I can identify them with points in the boundary manifold. OK, so I have the same four points here, C1, C0, R0, R1. Okay. A fact about ADS CFT is that if I introduce, in the bulk perspective, this quantum system, A0, near you know, this, this place, C0, in the bulk, then that same quantum information will be recorded locally near C0 in the boundary. OK, so we have A0 near C0 here, A1 near C1, and then B0 and B1 
coming out at the end. So the point is that we have the same inputs and the same outputs, and the same overall transformation relates them in the boundary perspective as in the bulk perspective. And this is just part of what it means when I say that the conformal field theory or the boundary like completely describes the bulk. It's just capturing the same process happening. Okay. What's important though, is that the way that it happens looks very different. And what I claim is that the way that it happens is via one of these non-local computations. Okay. To see that, the first thing to observe is just that in the boundary geometry, right, on my rectangle, if I try and bring A0 and A1 together, right, I can then get, you know, I could do the unitary and, and get the output out to say R0, but the causal features of this boundary are such that I just would be too late to get B1 to the correct spot. So these, these dashed lines are, are light rays, right? So I can't move, I can't move like this. This is, this is going faster than the speed of light. Um, so I can bring things together up here. And now I'm in the past at this point, but, but not this one. Okay. Similarly, I could have brought things together here. Then I can get my um, output out to R1, but not to R0. Okay. So, what this means is that there just is no place in the geometry where I can do the computation or where the computation can happen via this local kind of process. In, and instead, it will use this non-local one. Okay. To understand how this non-local picture maps into the space-time picture in a little bit more detail, it's helpful to think about what each of these four yellow dots mean in the space-time picture. So, if I think of this dot in the bottom left, for instance, which I'll call dot one, this is the process that happens you know, in the future of C0, right? Stuff comes from C0 into this dot and in the past of R0 and R1, right? Because information from one can get to R0 and it can get to R1. In the space-time picture, what this means is I should look at the future light cone of C0 the past of R0, which comes like this, and the past of R1, which comes like this, that picks out this diamond here. Okay, so this diamond here, we should think of as, as corresponding in the schematic picture to dot one. Okay, we can keep going reasoning like that. And dot one is this diamond here. Dot two on the bottom right will be this diamond just in the future of C1, right? And then say three up here, this is in the past of R0 and then the future of C0 and C1. So it will be this, this diamond like this. And then four will be here. Okay. If I think of the causal connections among those four diamonds, we see that one connects to four, one connects to three, two connects to three, two connects to four. That's exactly the set of causal connections represented by these wires here, right? One connects to three, one connects to four, two connects to four, two connects to three. Okay, so this causal diagram on the left is the same as the one on the right, it's just laid out on the page differently. Um, right, so, so the punchline here is that the, the boundary is reproducing this computation, which happens locally in the bulk, instead in a non-local form. And the basic reason is that because we have one fewer dimension, my geometry is somehow more restrictive and it just cuts out this place where I could have met up. Okay. Um, any questions about that? So are you sending sort of these messages, I guess this light through through the, I guess, through the bulk? So is that it, um, but you only rest on the on the on the boundary? I mean you only act on the boundary? Yeah, so it's it's a bit weird to get used to, but the um the bulk and boundary 
are like two descriptions of the, the same thing. And so there's, there's one process happening, right? Which I can think of as two light rays coming in from the boundary meeting in the bulk scattering region, some computation happening and then flying out again. Yeah. And then while that happens, or like there's an equivalent description of that in the conformal field theory mm -hmm. in, in one lower dimension. And that would look something like, you know, some information gets introduced at C1 and C0. It spreads out through the bulk and in, or through the boundary in some way, right? And then these output systems B0 and B1 appear at the end. And we're interested in probing like how that process looks. And then I'm saying it looks like this, um, this non-local computation. So anyways, yeah, the point is just, you shouldn't think of like, um, it's, yeah, it's not one description or the other. It's, it's, you know, they're both equally valid and. Understood. Yeah. But, but yeah. Okay. But and the one description is that everything in this, in this one dimension more, you can actually meet up in the middle and do this yeah. unitary and, and, and go out. But now that's not possible. I mean, in the other theory, you're only on the boundary and the only way out is sort of this long local computation to do things. Yeah, yeah, good. Exactly, exactly, yeah. Okay, any, any other questions? Yeah, so if you would want to imagine this sort of rectangle that you have in your slide as being sort of embedded in this cylinder, uh, yeah, which is how you can imagine ADSCT. So would you then have the C's on, a, on let's say, a circle around the boundary at some uh, time-like slice, and then the R's at a, on the boundary at another time like slice where the difference in time is like the, the yeah like, like is that the correct picture or is that that's right that's right so this this i've drawn what i've drawn here is the boundary perspective on this here so this say this is you know there's two pi angles around the circle this is at at zero this is at pi this is zero this is pi this is halfway in between. So I've placed this way halfway in between at pi over two. And then this is at three pi over two. And it's like this point up here. So yeah, it's, yeah. it's wrapped around. And then the input and output points are offset by, by pi over two. They're like right. rotated this way. Do all the all the let's say the 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 geodesics that depart at this line where the seas are on let's say do they all meet at a single point in the center is that uh, are you looking um, only at radially traveling geodesics let's say or is that not necessarily uh, uh, yeah so the geodesics um, say starting like the null geodesics that start here there's one that goes right through the middle and then if I add angular momentum, they they like come out mm -hmm. like this. Yeah. And this, so yeah. this in this case where um, where the time here is sort of is pi, like yeah, the time is pi. So the light mm -hmm. ray takes like pi to get up to to the time that these points are on. Um, you have to follow this radial geode geodesic and go right to the middle. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but if I if I made these a little bit later, like I I made a pi plus delta t or something, then you could have followed more of the geodesics, and this this place where you can meet in the bulk would get bigger. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But but those are not being drawn in the in the rectangle on the left, uh, right? Uh, you're only considering in in this in this drawing, let's say radially radial geodesics. Is that correct? In this drawing, I'm only yeah. considering the geodesics in the boundary manifold. Um, yeah, so so somehow like there's the bulk, it has its geometry, it has its light rays, and then there's a different theory that lives in the boundary with its own light rays. Um, and now those are the relevant ones to thinking about where information can travel. Mm -hmm. Uh, okay. Yeah. So yeah, it, none of these light rays are the radial ones. They're all like these boundary hugging ones. Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Thanks. Yeah. 
I just wanted to comment that it's actually kind of funny that in some sense it's more natural than the QPV setting because in the QPV setting we in the position yeah. verification setting we we say you know nobody can be present in this location yeah but attackers can still send signals through it like they can still maybe send some radio wave through it yeah. well for you I guess you really are not present in this bug. Yeah. <laughs> yeah that's right um yeah exactly so it's like yeah usually you would send you would say, okay, I'm going to replace a computation here with things that happen on the boundary, but I still have this sort of like trivial operation of send signals through the through the middle. And and here, like the peculiarities of of ADS space are such that um, I don't have to send light rays through the middle. Like you can go around this region, and it takes the same amount of time. And so, yeah, it just yeah, as you said. Okay. Um, anything else? This is one of the punchlines, so it's, it's. I'm happy to spend time on it. Okay. Um, okay. Good. So. So my idea was now that it takes too much entanglement to for this to be feasible. Well, yeah. So this is, this is a great question, <laughs> and this is what keeps me up at night. But uh, yeah, we'll we'll get into this. Um, Okay, so one way to, to understand what I was saying is that we could think of what is the set of all the computations that I can do inside of my scattering region in the bulk space time, right? And I'll, I'll that, that set is, is what I'm writing here. And then the observation here is that that set of computations has to be contained in another set of computations, which is all the things that you can do non-locally in the boundary, okay? We can make that statement a little bit more quantitative or a little bit more precise. The way that we do that is we're going to think about like a number or quantity on both the bulk and the boundary side. The bulk quantity I'm going to keep track of has to do with the geometry of the scattering region. So I was drawing it as a point before, but if I um, if I consider what it actually looks like, the scattering region looks like some kind of tetrahedron like this. The, the geometry of it isn't super important. What is important is that there's a sort of preferred surface on this scattering region, which is this lower like seam. That is a thing we call the ridge. And it's its area, which I'll call A sub R, that will be the relevant quantity in the bulk. Okay. Um, <clears throat> in the boundary, the quantity I'm going to keep track of is the amount of correlation in this shared resource state. Okay. Um, and in particular, in ADF CFT, the measure of correlation that you like have access to that you can compute is just the mutual information. And so we're going to keep track of, of the mutual information. Um, yeah, maybe I'll comment that these this resource state, right, on V0 V1. That was shared between these two yellow dots, which corresponded to these two diamonds. So this is the mutual information between like this part of your space time and this part of your space time. Okay. And you can you can like calculate what that is in, in ADS CFT. Okay. <clears throat> so then the quantitative restatement of this that you end up getting is that everything that's computable inside of the scattering region with a given area, A, is contained in the set of things that's computable non-locally using a resource system with mutual information of order A. Okay, it turns out that this mutual information and the area of this ridge um, are closely related. Okay. Um, yeah, so this is, this is a more quantitative statement of you know, what the connection is between non-local computation and, and ADS-CFT. I'm sorry, sorry, I don't quite uh, get it. Do you mean that you that this is what you should get from your ADS CFT correspondence, or do you mean that you actually have a protocol to to do it in some sense? Well, I I don't know about either either set here, right? So I don't know precisely what the set of things are that I can compute inside of a scattering region, um, and you know we know some things about what you can compute. Um, non-locally using a given amount of mutual information. And 
somehow the, these are ADS-CFT is saying that these match up. Um, yeah, but we can we can try and explore that. But um, is it not the case that you can do any say fast uh, quantum computation uh, um, in this scattering region? It's it's not totally clear. So um, oh, okay. that's sort of I think the sort of thing that this suggests is that yeah, in which I'll discuss later, is that it's possible that gravity constrains computation in some way. And, you know, people have speculated about this. I don't think there's any firm ideas, um, but I think that this non-local computation story is, is suggesting a precise route forward towards understanding what constraints on computation gravity places. So you could say, you know, we have gravity. If I try and build a really big computer or one that operates really fast that might involve energy scales that's really high and then gravity just will prevent me from doing that. Uh, oh, okay. Or, or maybe since we don't live in ADS, maybe this is another phenomenon that can take place in, in our in our world, but not in ADS. I think or is that, that uh, so somebody was commenting about ADS at small scales looking like um, like our universe. Uh, I think that's relevant here. So I could work in a limit where the scale of the curvature of the ADS space is much larger than my scattering region. And in that context, it's it would be very strange if that very weak curvature somehow had a serious effect on computation. And so, you know, I, I think it's legitimate to think about computation inside of a region like this as being similar to computation in an R gravitating universe. Okay, but then if this, I mean, maybe I'm fast forwarding and I'm interrupting you too, too many times, but if, if indeed the scaling is exponential uh, for the entanglement with very simple computations, then, uh, then actually this correspondence couldn't be there. Because they, uh, yeah, okay. so that, that's... With simple computations, you could actually do them uh, with sm actually also small computers. So, so gravity is not, is not going to have an effect on them. Yes, so you could say, like, I mean, of course, we don't have lower bounds like that on, on entanglement costs and non-local computation. Unfortunately not, yeah. yeah. But if if there were such bounds, then that would that would rep represent a serious puzzle for ADS-CFT, I think. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Um, okay, good. So so this is this is the connection to non-local computation. And now, you know, as, as we've already been discussing, this raises many questions about, okay, well, what set of computations can I do with a given amount of correlation? And how does this constrain gravity and so on? And so one thing that I've been exploring in my work is, you know, is this kind of question. And yeah, so I'm gonna make some comments about, about this. Okay, so yeah, we have this, this inclusion we were just discussing that all the computations that happen inside the scattering region should be computable non-locally with a resource state with this specific mutual information. Um, <clears throat> the sort of thing that I think this suggests that we would like to understand is, you know, what is the property of the unitary or the computation I'm doing that controls the entanglement cost needed to implement it non-locally, right? And one reason that this is a really interesting question is that, you know, if that entanglement cost controlled by whatever mysterious property that is, is larger than the area, it just, gravity or ADS-CFT is just saying you can't do it within this region. Okay. This is, one thing that's interesting about this is, you know, whatever this quantity is, it has to, it has to have a meaning in the bulk perspective, right? So we have this computation in the boundary perspective, the explanation for why it can't happen is that there's not enough entanglement, but the bulk physics doesn't, see that right it's an independent um yeah independent theory and so it should have its own mechanism for explaining why that computation can't happen and we would like to understand that mechanism and as part of that we want to understand like what is even the property of the unitary that that means that this entanglement cost is too large okay um so one suggestion and i'm not committed to this suggestion but you know, I think one idea that that kind of makes sense is that this could have something to do with the complexity of the operation you're doing. 
Um, so on the gravity side, something like this has been suggested in the past. So Seth Lloyd back in 2000 argued that gravity should constrain um, the circuit complexity of computations that can happen in a gravitating region. He gave an argument, his argument is not correct. There's an error in it. And this was pointed out by Stephen Jordan in 2017. Um, but for various reasons, which I could get into, this still seems like a plausible suggestion. Um, yeah, in particular, Jordan pointed out an assumption that Lloyd made that he hadn't been explicit about, but that assumption may actually be a reasonable one. Okay. This is kind of interesting also because the complexity appears in the non-local computation side of the story. So um, two examples of, of where it appears is in, uh, in some work by, by Florian, who's here, he gave an upper bound on the entanglement cost in terms of the circuit complexity. Phrase this slightly different, but you can interpret it as the, as the circuit complexity. Um, so that's yeah, one appearance of the complexity. Another appearance is if you restrict the kind of protocols that you're going to use. So you say, okay, I'm not going to do like arbitrary unitaries on each side. I'm going to have some specific set of operations. Um, you can get some stronger results. So in particular, for a particular set of operations, which correspond to what are called these garden hose protocols that Harry and, and others studied, you get upper and lower bounds on entanglement costs in terms of some kind of measure of complexity. So in this case, there's a, there's a classical function that's relevant, and uh, it's the space complexity of this function that, that appears. OK, so these are some appearances of the complexity raises a natural question of, you know, could it be that the complexity is this quantity that controls the entanglement cost? And I'm going to explore that in the rest of the talk. I won't have any definitive statements to make, but just some observations. Uh, any, any questions? No, OK. OK, so yeah, we're going to explore this. I have a yeah. problem still with the model. Yeah. Um, we have to, on the boundary these points zero C1. Then yep. if you want to perform the computation non-locally, there has to be this intermediate uh, entangled state, psi zero one. But where does it originate from? Uh, yeah, okay. That, that's a good question. So the in field theory. Um, the, the vacuum is a highly entangled state. So in particular, um, if I go to this picture I had, and I had these, these two diamonds, um, you can do a calculation in the conformal field theory. And what you will find is that these regions, V0 and V1, um, can be highly entangled when those diamonds are big enough. So yeah, so, so to, the way to think about this is like, there's for a particular geometry in the bulk. Okay, so there's, a, there's like this ADS space, that's one particular geometry. That geometry in the boundary description corresponds to having a particular like state in my conformal field theory. So I have like a fixed metric here and that in part fixes the, the state of my conformal field theory. And then what's happening is that the properties of this metric, like such that if the metric is such that you can meet up in the middle and do this computation, um, then the corresponding state in the field theory will have uh, a large amount of, of correlation between these two diamonds. Okay. Yeah. That was beyond my head, but sorry. Okay. <laughs> see where the um, is going. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. I, the, the short version is is that um, yeah, we're we're starting in some particular state in the field theory, which has a bunch of correlation in it. And you can milk it. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Thanks. So you don't have to like actively prepare EPR pairs or something. It's like the state in the in the boundary that 
corresponds to being able to meet in the bulk already like has it for you. Okay. Yeah. But yeah, it's a good, it's a good question. Okay. Okay. Um, right. So we want to explore this relationship between complexity and entanglement in non-local quantum computation. Good place to start uh, is uh, is Clifford's. Clifford's are nice and easy. Um, so we're going to think about doing Clifford unitaries non-locally. Um, and in particular, I'm going to think about Clifford unitaries acting on n q kits, so n k-dimensional uh, subsystems. And then what I mean by the Cliffords is I'm going to generalize the poly group to act on q kits, and then I'm going to think about the normalizer of that poly group. Okay. Here I have a good handle on both the complexity and the entanglement, so this will be helpful. The entanglement cost for doing these Cliffords non-locally. Um, is bounded above by something that's linear in the number of q kits. Okay, so it's like n times log k. Um, there's a simple protocol that does this, which just involves um, a, a sort of Bell basis teleportation. The complexity of the Cliffords is captured by a particular complexity class called mod kl. Okay. In per the, the precise statement there is that the uh, the problem of like simulating a measurement outcome or predicting a measurement outcome of a, of a state prepared by a Clifford circuit is a complete problem for this complexity class mod KL. Mod KL is a slightly obscure class. Um, you may not have heard of it. If you haven't heard of it, just take it to be defined by the statement I just made that these Cliffords are a complete problem for it. So this is the set of problems you can solve by reducing to uh, running a Clifford circuit and then measuring an outcome. One thing you do need to know about the class, though, is that it sits between P and L. Okay, so um, yeah, it's smaller than than P poly time and bigger than or contains L log space. We think both of those inclusions are strict, right? So we think these, and we have uh, uh, very strong arguments for both of those. Okay. Now the idea here is that we're going to explore this, this notion that it could be the complexity that controls entanglement by, by thinking along the following lines. So in the example of Clifford's, we have complexity mod KL and a low entanglement cost, in particular a linear cost. And then we're going to say, if it's really the case that complexity controls entanglement, then it should be true that any other computation I try and do, not just running a Clifford, but something else, um, if that computation has complexity inside the class mod KL, then we should be able to do it using a, also a small amount of entanglement. I'm going to allow for polynomial overheads. So even though this was linear, I'm just going to require that um, any other computation with a similar complexity should come out to be polynomial. Okay. So if, if complexity controls entanglement, this is a consequence. We're going to explore that idea by trying to check this, this consequence. And along the way, we'll learn some, some other interesting things. OK. Um, so yeah, we're going to test this in the context of, uh, of this f-routing computation. OK, so an f-routing computation is defined by a choice of, uh, of function f. And it's a function from strings of length 2n to bits. Uh, the inputs to the computation are a string x of length n on the left, a quantum system q um, of some dimension d on the left, and then a string y of length n on the right. Okay. The outputs from the, to, from the computation or what you need to do is to bring the quantum system q to the side labeled by f. Okay, so if f is 0, you should bring q to the left, and if f is 1, you should bring Q to the right. OK. This is a well-studied computation. Um, because it's especially favorable in the context of position verification, um, in particular, Florian and, and Matthias Christendel and uh, Bloom, whose first name I'm forgetting, uh, showed that the entanglement cost for doing this non-locally, so for cheating in these position verification schemes, scales with n, the size of the classical inputs, 
And so this makes the, the, um, the dishonest strategy much harder than the classical strategy. But, okay. This was also studied um, by, by Harry and, and a number of others. And they gave what my understanding is previously was the, the most efficient attack or, or method for doing this computation non-locally. That was this garden hose strategy that I mentioned before. It has um, an entanglement cost that is controlled by the space complexity of this function, an exponential in the space complexity. And so the functions that you can do in log space correspond to um, the function, or sorry, the functions that you can do with polynomial entanglement corresponds to the functions in log space. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Good. So this is after routing. And then the idea is we can ask, okay, can we do better than log space? And based on this expectation raised by the idea that it could be complexity that controls entanglement, we should expect that yes, it is, or you can do better. And we should expect that because the Cliffords have complexity mod KL and mod KL contains L and we think that that's strict. Right. Another reason to think that you might be able to do better, and actually the first reason I started thinking about this is that if L log space was optimal, then what it would mean is that when you try and do computations in the scattering region, so what it would mean from the gravity perspective, it would mean that you're somehow restricted to using an amount of memory that's logarithmic in your area. Because we don't understand quantum gravity super well, I can't tell you that that strictly doesn't make sense, but that would be very surprising. And, and the intuition was that this, this shouldn't be right. Okay. Um, given that we think we can do better, we can ask, you know, how could we do better? What sort of tools could we introduce? Here, um, we can take a little bit of at least loose inspiration from an ADS CFT. So, ADS CFT, as I've been arguing, does non local quantum computation. And part of the story there that I haven't been discussing is that, you know, in ADS CFT, the way that information in the bulk is recorded into the boundary um, is in terms of an error correcting code. That plays some important role. Let's see if, if error correction could also be useful in the context of non-local computation. Okay, so this is kind of a loose idea, but that's what we're going to try. Also, I notice I'm at an hour, so I don't know uh, how, how long should I tr take to try and wrap up. Maybe five more minutes. Five more minutes, okay. Um, okay, good. So let's try and use error correction to do these things. I will start with just a really simple example. So the example I'm going to use Evan, is, yeah. Sorry. Um, so um, so you, you improved it to this mod P, P, uh, L classes or mod KL. I haven't shown that yes, that yet, but yes. But, uh, uh, but that's still, I mean, that still has, has the problem, right? That P, it, it still has the problem. Yeah. It's, it's, it's still not P. Yeah, yeah. Right. Um, yeah, so it you know goes a very small ways towards resolving this kind of tension that that's there. But but as you say, it, it, it's not like I, I think that the class of things you can do inside the scattering region is mod KL and we're done. It's just you know. But do you think it's P? It yeah, that's a good question. Um, I'm I'm not quite sure what to take from from the gravity picture. I think a reasonable guess would be BQP. Oh, oh, even more. Okay, because uh, yeah, I don't see why a, 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 from the gravity perspective, a, a quantum gate should be much harder than a classical one. But yeah, okay. So then you have to be able to push this up much further. Yeah, yeah very okay. far. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, okay, so let me. I'll, I'll try and wrap up in, in the next bit, but let me give the rough intuition for how we use error correction to improve um, to improve on the garden hose and and do this writing task for more functions. Um, so here's the example. I'm going to use a, a case where x and y are just of length one, so they're just bits, zero or one. And then uh, the function I'm going to think about is the and function, so f is just x and y. And then uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take q, and I'm going to record it into an error correcting code. And it's going to be a really simple error correcting code that has three shares that corrects one erasure error. So here's my three shares, S1, S2, and S3. Then um, 
what I'm going to do is I'm, I'm going to specify my protocol for you by telling you what to do with each of those three shares. Okay. Um, the first share, S1, I'm just going to always keep on the left. Okay. So Q starts out on the left. The encoding happens on the left. So S1 starts out on the left. You just leave it there. So in my, in my little table here, we see that S1 is always on the left. Okay. S2, I'll do something slightly more interesting, which is I'm going to look at the bit X and I'm going to send S2 to the side labeled by X, right? So I'll either you know, keep it or send it based on if X is zero or one. Okay, so in the table, we see that S2 is on the left when X is zero and on the right uh, when, when X is one. Okay, S3, we do something similar, which is I'm going to bring S3 to the side labeled by Y. This is slightly harder because Y starts out on the right and S3 starts out on the left. Um, but you can get around that by using entanglement. One way you could think about this is I'm basically you know, using earlier protocols, using the garden hose protocol to bring S3 to the side labeled by you know, some simpler function, F, which is just equal to Y. Right? So we could just do that using order one entanglement. If, um, if I do that and I bring the shares to, this, to the sides as labeled in the table, we see that we've actually completed the task for the AND function. That's because whoever holds two out of the three shares can recover Q, right? In these first three cases, two, at least two shares are on the left. So Q is on the left. And indeed, those are the cases in which X and Y is zero, which is when Q is supposed to be on the left. In the last case here, X and Y is one, right? And we see that correctly, there are two shares on the right now, so we can recover Q on the right, okay? So that explanation was slightly detailed, um, but the, the sort of general strategy is we're going to look at the function F and try and match the structure in that function to the structure in the error correcting code of like which subsets recover Q and which don't. Okay, um, so I'm running out of time, so I'm, I'm just gonna fly through things, but um, we can generalize that by replacing the simple like threshold code, code with, a, with a general quantum secret sharing scheme that has a more interesting access structure. Using that, um, you can do this F routing task for any indicator function. So an indicator function describes the pattern of, of um, what shares recover the secret in a quantum secret sharing scheme. Um, using the same protocol as, as on the last slide, but replacing the simple code with a quantum secret sharing scheme, you get an upper bound on the entanglement cost for, F, for indicator functions that's given by the size of the quantum secret sharing scheme. So you see there's also this relationship between non-local computation and, and secret sharing in that you can get lower bounds on the size of secret sharing schemes. Um, right, and then you go and use some fancy quantum secret sharing schemes, in particular this one due to Adam Smith back in 2000, you add a few extra tricks on and you see that you can get in polynomial entanglement, all the functions in the class mod KL. Okay, so this brings things a little bit into more alignment with this complexity controls entanglement idea um, and improves on the garden hose in that, in that it does mod KL, which we think strictly contains L. Um, I'm going to skip these last two thoughts and then I'll just conclude. Um, so yeah, summary argued in the first part of the talk that ADS CFT does you know, you, the same computation happens locally in the bulk as, and then happens non-locally in the boundary, right? So understanding non-local computation, I think is part of understanding, you know, sort of how this map between the bulk and the boundary works and how um, you know bulk dynamics is reproduced in the boundary okay so yeah and then there's a sort of more quantitative statement you can get out of this which is that all the computations that are computable within the scattering region with some given area must be computable non-locally with um, a mutual information of the same order as the area this raises in a, i think an interesting question of 
which is sort of the same question as, as, as is relevant cryptographically of, you know, what is the quantity that controls the entanglement cost? And um, yeah, we tried to explore that, come up with this new uh, F-routing protocol, found this connection to secret sharing. Some things I didn't mention is that um, you can prove a lower bound on entanglement cost from the complexity. It's a terrible lower bound. It has two logs, but it, the complexity at least appears, right? So we know that log log complexity is less than the entanglement cost, which is less than two to the complexity where this is, this is Florian's upper bound. Um, another thing I've looked at is just like in the garden hose where you restrict to a very particular set of uh, protocols that just involve bell basis measurements, you can also try and restrict just to doing Clifford's on both sides. If you do that, you can get upper and lower bounds again, just like in the garden hose, you get upper, lower and bounds. And here, um, the complexity yeah, is, has a very tight upper and lower bound on the entanglement cost. Okay, so that's everything. Thank you. And uh, yeah, look forward to your comments. Thank you, Alex. Uh, Thank you. Very nice. I will stop the recording now. And uh, if people have more questions, they can ask them. Do 